ready. I'm ready, Chad. I'm ready. I'm very excited to be. We're, this is our fifth week of Big Big Live already. Our our uh, quarantine friendly drag show that we've been doing here on all digital platforms, some of which I didn't know existed. I'm so happy you are here with us, and really, uh, we have amazing guests, which I will get to. I want to tell you, though, tomorrow is what started all this, for the anniversary, the one-year anniversary of what started this for me, and that's this book right here, Drag Coming Through the Big Wigs of Show Business. About five or six years ago, someone at Rizzoli, an editor, said, someone needs to do a book on drag, and I think it should be you. And, and so I, I thought, and I thought, oh my God, you know, I, am I the right person? I, I've only done drag a little bit, and I always look like someone from the far side cartoons. When I do, there's no glamour. And then I thought, oh my God, I'm, I'm drag hag number one. And I, I've been a, a drag hag since I was four years old, and I saw Herman Munster get hit by a bolt of lightning and turn into a cocktail waitress. That's how it happened for me. And so I, I, I've loved it, and I, it is my absolute favorite art form. And three of the most wonderful practitioners of the art form are with us today. And our first guest, I'm going to welcome each one of them separately, but our first guest is the Kevin Bacon of Big Wigs Live, because she has worked with all of us, including me. Uh, she was not only uh, in Mr. Act, which she created with, with Latrice Royale, but she also was a judge on Dragula. And we did a panel at a wonderful place called the Academy in San Francisco. She is a legendary performer, an amazing filmmaker, known particularly for the film All About Evil and so many other credits. She is truly legendary. Peaches Christ, welcome to our show. Peaches. Hello, hi. How are you, darling? You look beautiful. Oh, thank you so much. I'm doing well. How are you, Frank? Good hanging in there. Uh, right. we're, we're doing our thing, and folks, are, I'm going to ask you later after I welcome everyone what you've been up to with the quarantine situation and looking gorgeous. Last time I saw you, you were uh, in Mufti, as they say, so not as, as, uh, as turned funny. out as this, but you look beautiful. And I, I have to say, I'm looking at your background. I love what you've done with the place. It looks beautiful. I wanted everyone to see a little bit about, you know, what it's like quarantining in my home. You know, and so here we go. This is my foyer here in San Francisco. Oh, it looks great. easy to clean, or well, you have staff. You don't have to worry. Very about easy it. to clean. Yes. Good. Yeah, it looks good. I have to say. All right. Now you're also connected to our next guest, who was voted Miss Congeniality on RuPaul's Drag Race, and I want to make her season four. And then back. I forgot how this works, but we're going to ask her. Uh, how back for two editions of. RuPaul's Drag Race All Stars, and we we love her a lot. And you performed with her in Mr. Act and maybe other things. Please welcome Latrice Royale. Latrice, hey baby. Hi, honey. How are you? Oh my God, you look gorgeous. Look at your Thank fronds. You. Your Thank hair you. and your palm fronds are beautiful. <laughs> Just little sum sum, you know. You look great. It's it's terrific to see you. And and well, I want to find out how things are in in Florida and and. Uh, I, it's, it's a delight to, to get to be with you here in this. And people are very excited, I have to say. They're, they don't call you Miss Congeniality for nothing because the girls love you out there. Well, thank you. I try to be nice. <laughs> yeah, more than a lot of us say, actually. But uh, it's uh, the way it was. But we're going to hear all about what's going on with you. But I want to welcome someone else. And Peaches Christ also is connected to this guest because Peaches was uh, a judge on all three, se if, if the interweb is correct, on all three seasons of Dragula. That's and nice. so the winner of season, is that true, Peaches? That's all three correct. I, I believe I'm uh, the only person who's yeah, judged okay. all three seasons besides my friend Darren Stein. And I'm pushing the Boulay brothers to make me oh. their Michelle Visage. I think I should be on every episode. I'm with you. I think that's a great idea. I just, I, a thumbs up from, from me. Um, so I hope you voted. It'll be awkward if you didn't vote for our next year. So I hope you were thumbs up uh, on our bitch pudding is with us. Bitch pudding, welcome to the show. Uh, okay. She'll be on in a second. Hold on, we're getting her on. So just chat with the other two. She'll be here in a second. Okay. Whoa, awkward. Looking, last I heard, she was looking for her hair from what I've heard. But you know what? So was I. And I hope she has better luck than I did. It didn't 
It totally didn't work for me. Peaches, we've got to tell people, you and I did that panel. At, there's a place in San Francisco that's sort of uh, like a gentleman's club is what it really yeah. feels like. And it's sort of like Soho House uh, in New York or Los Angeles, but it's called The Academy. And right. we did a panel. It was, it was intimate, but boy, it, it was so eye-opening and, and, um, and it was, it touched the heart. It, it, I thought it'd be lighthearted and fun. And here we did this panel with, with Sister Roma. And we yeah. ended up, you know, what it means to be a drag queen, what it means to give back to the community. And, uh, and it was great. And, and uh, do, you, do you like talking about the art of drag? Um, yeah, I do. I actually really, I mean, I'm still a big drag fan after all these years. You know, I obviously started doing drag because I loved it and I still really love drag. And, you know, especially people, you know, like Sister Roma, you know, who, um, you know, I, I admire so much. Like, you know, what was great about that night was like people were asking kind of hard hitting questions. <laughs> do you remember? And yeah. they're kind of, kind of putting us on the spot weepy there it was, yeah. it was it was very san francisco i have to say it wasn't very you know just sequence it was like here's the the community component and the, the you know working for uh, to give back and and uh yeah it was not exactly uh what i expected at all but it was it was pretty amazing so yeah. everyone wants to know and i'm going to find the person who gets credit for this question even though i would have asked it myself but Paige wrote in and said, what are you doing to pass the time away during quarantine? Do you want to get us started, Peaches? Sure. Um, well, like every other queen, um, you know, I, 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 or at least most drag queens I know, I make m most of my living, 99.9% .9 of my living off of live events and performances and, you know, being able to appear in front of an audience. And so when that was kind of just taken away, overnight, um, you know, I think we, we panicked for about 24 hours and then it was like drag queens were the first to just go online, you know, like put on a wig and it was like that weekend there were drag shows online. And so I've actually done um, a couple of those. I did one for the stud, the historic stud bar here in San Francisco and I uh, put together a number for them. And then uh, I started working with Jinx Monsoon and Binda La Creme and major scales because we were all together when this happened. We were actually rehearsing for um, a, a live event here in San Francisco of mine uh, called Drag Becomes Her. And so we were kind of commiserating because it all happened when we were together. And we and it was really major scales who said, what if we did an old timey radio show? Something that provides oral pleasure, if you will. Um, oral, A-U-R-A-L. You know? um, also good, that's yes, good yes, too. Yes. Yes. So, so we've been the last four or five weeks, we've been writing scripts and recording our voices in different cities and trying to figure out how to make this all work and then editing it together. And we just put out our first episode of WQUR Queer Quarantine Radio. So <laughs> that, that I'm really excited about. And it's been fun working with those guys. Oh, there's Bitch. Ah! How y'all doing? Good. <laughs> Welcome to the show. I Sorry, just... find my hair, but I'm glad you found yours. I like put it on, girl. I just found one. I found one that looked like a Pomeranian. Just put it on my hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I need next. I think just to... maybe I'll just. I have a Boston Terrier. I'll just put her on my head. Right? That's She's cute. Be... Just put a lip that'll on her. Put her on. That'll be a look. So, yes. Latrice, let me ask you a question. Uh -huh. We're talking about quarantining and what it's been like. So, bitch, I'll get to you next. But Latrice, what's okay. the quarantine process been like for you? What have you been up to? Um, you know what? I have been getting back into painting. I've been doing some artwork, and I'm um, working on a little butterfly collection. And um, so that brings me joy and relaxation and help me ease my mind and you know, kind of do something creative and keep my juices flowing. You know what I mean? Because, you know, I can't go in crazy. But I'm welcoming this lovely, <laughs> this lovely change of sitting at the house for a minute. You know what I mean? Because you're traveling so much. Usually, oh my God. Right? So much, so much. So this is what, it was actually a welcome change for me. Um, and I'm totally cool with it. But I do miss the live element of doing what we do. And so, um, it's, it's a learning curve for everybody, but we all here doing it. We doing it. And I'm not that technologically savvy. So I'm learning. 
I don't know. You look gorgeous. So that's well, all. Thanks. In the, I, I'm in not the center here. of the screen, we can hear you beautifully, and you look beautiful. So well, I thanks. think you're, you've nailed it. And how? So how? Do you, how long? Uh, how many months worth of little soaps do you have from staying in hotels? <laughs> Soap and lotion. <laughs> <laughs> I I have enough shampoo to last me uh, if I had all your hair and I, I would be able to uh, to have enough shampoo. Yeah, I have I have a, about a year worth of product. I think yeah. of, of all sorts. Now, bitch, Putin, what has quarantine been like for you? That was the first question that someone sent in. They want to know what's going on. What's Ooh. quarantine been like? It's been a good hoot and a holler. I'll tell you that. <laughs> It's been nonstop. I didn't stop working. I just said, you know what? We're all going to be locked up. Fuck, we're going to do a drag show and have a good old time. That's what I've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> and your digital drag show, you've got numbers we all would kill for. Oh, you thank you. So many just, people tuning in. Yeah, it's been really great. Each and every week, we have about uh, 25 to 30 entertainers all over the planet, and we're open to all kinds of drag. We have a very diverse catch each and every week. Um, regardless if you've been, like, if you're the girl down the street, hosting bingo on Tuesday nights, you know, the Susie Q down the street at the dive bar, or you've been on a national, international platform like Drago, RuPaul's Drag Race, we have everybody in between, because we're all affected by this, you know. Coronavirus is, took no prisoners, bitch. She robbed us of all of our gigs, and I was like, really kind of depressed when I saw it happen, because I saw like, regardless if you were Susie Q, or you've been on an international platform, like I saw all my friends post their social media being like, here's my Venmo, here's my Cash App, here's my PayPal, here's my Cameo, I just started a Cameo, help me out, anything you can help. And I was like, we can do a show, we can still make our art, and uh, that's what inspired me to start the show. You know, speaking of Venmo. <laughs> oh! I want to tell you, there's a plug. Venmo, a virtual cover, if they'd like, if you can, if you can't, we understand it, if you, if you can, we'd appreciate it. But there it is, so you Venmo to Big Wigs Live, and uh, and it'll go to uh, the queens and the crew of Big Wigs Live. And Look, my wig is right there. My wig is there right there. <laughs> so Venmo your little hearts out, if you will, and keep us all, uh, 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 in groceries. Uh, oh, let me ask, this is like a, one of those lightning round questions. Uh, eating or not eating right oh now? My God. Oh, oh my God. Oh, my God. The house, booth. <laughs> eating the house. Yeah. Yes. I have yeah. gained the COVID 19. Not 19. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm, I'm serious. They're going to, I'm going to, they're going to need a forklift to bring me to the Castro Theater when this is over. Girl. <laughs> no. I'll tell you, I'll come out about something I don't need to tell the audience. I can wear the shirt I'm wearing only if I'm standing up, does it all button. So there are, there are several buttons oh. from here oh. down that do not button. So it's, I you know, but boobs up, I'm, I'm just fine. But that middle spare tire, you know, and meanwhile, the moment this is over, I've got chicken parm that's, that I made going right in the oven. Ready so, to go. Blast. We're I've been making that. lasagna, bitch, pizza. Yeah. I've been eating the fuck up out of everything. You can't tell me not to. I'm, I'm glad I don't have to be corset right now. My guts, like, my tuck is all out underneath this camera, girl. I'm like a um, Good Morning America person. You know, that trade that had his, you know, he was wearing his box of briefs, but he had the business suit on top. That's what I'm doing right now. Yeah. Yeah, I've got... Sweatpants from the waist down. That's the way it goes. That's the way the world is. But let's pretend it's the most glamorous time ever, and let's go for that. I want to ask each of you. Uh, let's we'll go backwards order now. Bitch Puddin', let me start with you. All Who right. was the first drag performer or or cross dressing actor or perform? You know, so who was the first person you ever saw doing some form of drag? Any form. So I wasn't out yet. This is like freshman year of college. I went to a production of La Cage Le Faux in uh, New York City in Broadway. And I saw uh, the cast there. And there was a drag queen outside introducing people. And she was fucking tall. The bitch was obviously like six, seven out of heels. So she was like even more taller out of that. So we got a group picture of me looking like a knockoff Justin Bieber next to her. It's really cute. But the first entertainer and the first real drag show I saw was in a little bar in Virginia Beach, Virginia called Rainbow Cactus. Hi, Rainbow Cactus, so if y'all watching this. Um, and I saw Mercedes Douglas host on the mic. And um, I just, like, that was my first introduction to a real drag show. And I was like, oh, this bitch is funny. I kind of like this. But it wasn't Lily Whiteass that you were talking to at that first show. That's who I met at that. That was the first time I ever met her outside Lacage. She was one of the girls out front. And that was her name, Lily Whiteass. She literally looked like 
she looked like a very handsome man with a wig on. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm not with Miss Lily. So I don't know if that was Lily, but like it was a very. I felt like this was a Broadway after putting the wig on for the get for the check. You know what I mean? I don't think this is one of the working girls that did it. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, Lily was a working girl, but she was she was happy to be in it. Now, Latrice, who's the first person in drag you ever remember seeing, or the first cross dresser? You know, it's when you ask that. I was 16 years old. And I was still in high school, but my mother used to, I'm, you know, I'm from LA, from Compton, originally. And I used to live in the Valley, Marino Valley, with the spot area. My mother would let me, like, drive off for the weekend to go to Vegas, like, with my friends. Like, she just trusted me to do that. And um, the first drag show I ever saw was Kenny Kerr, the legend guy. <gasps> oh, yes, they left amazing. in Vegas. And it was, like, mind-boggling blowing i could not believe this is the man in the dress he sang he danced he had the whole impersonation show i was just blown away and like i didn't think i was ever gonna do drag but i was intrigued <laughs> i was definitely intrigued and kenny care really was a oh, legendary legendary legend. performer Absolutely. so i i've seen a lot of the biggies you know i saw divine and sylvester and even milton burl in a dress back in the day but uh, not he was old. I mean, that's not like I was there in the 50s, for God's sake. But, uh, but anyway, but I, you know, so I've seen a lot of the, the real legends. But Kenny Care, I never did see in person. Um, Jim man. Bailey, yes, Kenny Care, no. But the reputation, and, and we've got to keep telling the stories and, and making sure people know who that is. But what an, an amazing uh, person to see first. Yeah. Pete, who was first for you? I, I know a little bit of your story, but who was your, your entree into the world of drag? Well, uh, I grew up in Maryland, uh, in Annapolis, and when I was in junior high, you know, I remember so well the, the discussion around the making of this new movie, you know, it was John Waters' crossover film, the media all covered the movie Hairspray, and everyone talked about how the mom in the movie was played by a man, and I had to pretend like that meant nothing to me, I wasn't really interested in that, but of course, deep down inside, I was like, ooh! have to see that what the fuck is that about you know so i saw hairspray and became obsessed with divine and i mean like totally and completely obsessed and obsessed with the world that john waters painted and you know back then at video stores there was no carding kids so i w i went and rented pink flamingos and female trouble and all those movies and really you know like latrice says my mind was blown and there was kind of no turning back for me it was like the whole world view I had changed overnight with that discovery. Yeah, that I mean, Divine and John Waters, that whole ethos, if it made sense to you, it just kind of warped your mind. And, and you were like, oh, I, I, you know, it's like, I think it's the, I found my tribe uh, kind, of, kind of thing. In the um, best possible way, it was like, we were proud, we were allowed to be proud of being perverted degenerates. And you could you can't do this anymore, but you could lick the banister back in the day, and it or the, you know or the couch, and it would reject people who are horrible, you know. So you, could, well, I love those movies, and they had a huge impact on me as well. And and then to get to meet Divine years ago was amazing. And uh, someone was posted about a, a club called La Cage in Chicago, and it mm. brought me right back today. It was a program from there. On uh, 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 they posted on Instagram, and that was where I saw Divine live the first time uh, in about 80, 83, maybe something like that. And she told the filthiest joke I'd ever heard the, the Denver omelet joke. So I'm telling a long story, but I'll make it fast. The other day, I said, I told the I can't say the name because it'll react to me. I said to the Amazon device that listens to every word we say. <laughs> I won't okay. say her name. Miss I said, shuffle songs by Divine. And it started to play Divine songs. And then there was this interlude. And it was Divine telling the filthy Denver omelet joke on my device. <laughs> so I, wow. I advise everyone if they have the A word mm -hmm, girl in her, the little that thing you talk to in your house. Say shuffle songs by Divine, and you'll and make sure there are no children around because it's filthy. But uh, but it's a, a a thrill and and a delight. Now, Peaches, I remember you telling me your origin story is one of the funniest and most original 
Um, and it's also a caution, as I recall, it's a cautionary tale, you said. So how did Peaches Christ first come into being? Um, well, I was uh, a film student. I studied film production because after the discovery of John Waters and growing up obsessed with horror movies and anything spooky, I decided I wanted to be a filmmaker. And I was already a performer working, you know, in, in the drama club and I was in an improv theater troupe and all that. Um, but it wasn't until I was a senior in college making a movie called Jizz Mopper, a love story, uh, <laughs> that I actually did draft. And um, so I'm in, so Peaches was born in the movie Jizz Mopper. And so my caution to young drag performers is you may not want your very first time in drag to be, you know, ca forever captured on 16 millimeter film. You know, <laughs> no, it's not pretty. No. I mean, and wasn't it because an actor flaked and didn't show up? Wasn't that what that, happened? That's right. So originally the um, character was Coco and she was played by a friend of mine who was Puerto Rican. And when uh, the friend kept like flaking, and this is in central Pennsylvania, I went to Penn State, like there weren't drag queens hanging out in the mid nineties that you could just go and ask, you know, drag, it was kind of risky, you know, um, you know, like, I mean, literally I got like bashed and stuff for being in drag in Pennsylvania. Sure. And it was all worth it, but you know, it was it was a scary time to do drag and be out in public. And so I don't ever blame him. In fact, I really thank him because when he stopped showing up, it was kind of like I had to step in and play the character so that the film could get made and so I could graduate. <laughs> and then Peaches was born and the rest is history. I was gonna say, by him not showing up, he really gave the world a tremendous gift. So uh, thank oh, heaven right. for people who don't show and for uh, show ponies who say, what the hell, I'm going on. And then you went and did it. So so that's fantastic. Now, Latrice, I got to ask you, how did Wanda Wayne really play into your, your origin story from In Living Color? Oh, honey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like, um, it was Halloween, so we were, you know, it was it was a dare, and it was Halloween, and so um, I was like, I could do Wanda, honey, hey, word up, I'll rock your world, you know, and um, I looked a hot mess, but uh, then after that, my friends convinced me to do the amateur show at the World Famous Copa here in South Florida, God rest your soul. Um, <laughs> those walls, if they could talk. Um, if they had walls. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but I, I did that first show. I was a hot mess. Uh, I got a fashion citation because uh, <laughs> my outfit was horrible. And then I came back and I won. And then that was the beginning of the end. Like, now you can't get me out of the dress. 28 I, years later, yeah. I was going to say, I, I love that, that when, you know, when pop culture can play into this, you know, uh, way that, you know, I mean, that show did for you what the John Waters Dreamlanders did right. for Peaches. Yeah. And then, because I want to feel old, I looked into the origin story of Bitch Puddin'. And then oh I God. was- <laughs> I'm ready for that story. <laughs> I was, tell folks, I, I, if it's true, I watched a video uh, from a from a late t late night TV show, a little short film, and I howled, and I thought, is that really where Bitch Puddin' came from? Ooh, what was the reference that you watched? Was it Robot Chicken? Was that yeah, Annie? my name came oh. from Robot Chicken, yeah. So, um, yeah! hi, Seth Green, you're watching this, hi. Uh, so, yeah, I was doing a charity show in college. Um, this was recently after season four of Drag Race started, so I'm connected to Latrice in that way, so I have to say, girl. Um, so we watched it, and like I like we were trying to figure out a charity show, and the club kind of tossed it off to me. All right, bitch, you have to do the charity event. I'm like, fuck it, we're doing a drag show. We sold out in two days. There was like, around like $5,000 for uh, Equity Fight Dates, Broadway Cares. And um, it was really fun. And after we're, like, we were starting the, the whole show, and everyone's like, well, I'm going to be Giselle. I'm going to be Monica. And I was like, I want to be the girl that got fucked by the lacrosse team and then showed up to work. Like, I want to be like the most like hooker, <laughs> trash, skunk in the room. Like, if you're going to be a dude, <laughs> have a good time with it. Uh, so I would love to make my, what was the name of the film? Jizz? I would love to make Jizz my Mopper. debut. Jizz Mopper. I, I would love to audition for that part. If you do a reboot, Peaches, I am so down for that. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of like how I got my start. And then I was trying to find like the most disgusting name. And I remember this iconic skit from Robot Chicken where it's like a parody of Strawberry Shortcake. And she's trying to name her sister Apple Dumpling. And randomly, this like neighbor comes in and she goes, oh, hello, bitch pudding. And then she's just like a complete fucking rotted little piece of shit. 
and cusses everybody out and just leaves. And I was just like, ooh, that's the name. That's the name. And it's funny because later I ended up working for Cartoon Network. So I was kind of like dabbling in drag. And then I got a kind of legit big girl job at Cartoon Network. And then I was like nervous because like they knew who I was when I like got on to it. So I was like, oh, I'm going to get a cease and desist. I'm going to get some kind of subpoena. And then somehow I was like later in a random meeting with like adult swim people. And I was just sweating the entire time. I was like, all set. And then eventually they were like, oh, we know who you are. We think you're cool. So that's all good. Hi, Cartoon yeah, that Network. That must be a really <laughs> I, I watched the Adult Swim one where it's bitch pudding at the funeral. of. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So then like they, that was their first introduction. And they have several different things with her where she just like fucks up the funeral and like with Miss Grandma and shit. It's a good time. She's just a rotted little character. <laughs> See, this is, this is why I like drag and why I like the gays the best. I have to say. Because there, it, you take pop culture and you turn it into something new and wonderful and twisted and delicious and, and get out there and, and make a whole new generation of people really, really happy. So um, let me ask this. Bitch, what was, what was Peaches like as a judge on the show? <laughs> oh, I knew it was legit when I saw Coco Peru and Peaches Christ all walk on set because I was like, they are in high horse drag and the Blaze have them out here in the fucking wilderness, bitch. We were out in the middle of nowhere in the fucking log cabin. We all could have gotten killed. That would have been a great spinoff movie. That would have been fucking fierce. But yeah, it was <laughs> such a good time. And like, I just was like, also, we only had one take. And the whole time I was trying to glue on my nails, they're like, hurry up, bitch, just get your fucking nails on. And I was like, but it's Coca Guru and me just fucking Christ. Which you find out when you're on set, like who's gonna be judging you. And we only had one take and like, I, they got, I had my improv trading at SCAD, hi SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design, and it turned out to be really great. Um, but yeah, I thought it was really awesome. I just felt for them, cause like I was kind of naked, but they were also like, you know, there to help, like judge the show. And it was like freezing that night. It got so fucking cold. But you know, how fucking punk rock, we were a whole bunch of drag queens out in the middle of the wilderness and having a good time. Like, I'm so thankful for the Belay Brothers for that experience. And I'm like, Peaches was so fucking sweet. I, I killed it, you know? So like, I was lucky. I didn't, I didn't bomb it like some of the other girls. <laughs> <laughs> so what did being on Dragula mean for your life and your career? It meant a lot to me, because when I watched season one, although it was like kind of rough around the edges, you know, there was like a lot of icons that come from that show. It's like Pinche, Meatball. Vander Von Ott, of course, season one winner. Uh, but when I saw that show, I saw queer individuals uninhibitedly able to be themselves. They were 100% themselves. They were super punk. They're all from different walks of life in downtown LA. It was gritty, it was raw, that promo, it just spoke to me. But like when I watched the show, I was like, this doesn't really fit. And then I saw one of the characters when they got eliminated, they looked like an 80s prostitute hooker. And I was like, oh, if they like that, then I'm, this is the party I need to fucking be in on. So when I got on the show, it was really fun. Uh, there was a turbulent first two episodes. But I turned it right on around and I didn't have to win in the end. But it was seriously life-changing. You know, I think as a performer in a queer spectrum, especially with drag, you try to get on any platform you can. Um, and, you know, you're auditioning for stuff. Like, honestly, like my college thesis was I convinced my professors to let me audition for Drag Race and make that my thesis. And when I did that, I had fun, but the whole time I felt a little sacrificing, you know, that filthiness, that like a part of bitch pudding that really makes me who I am. Like I love pit play, I love, I'm a fucking pig. All right. So um, <laughs> when I auditioned for Dragula, I just was like, it felt right. And when I was on set, it felt right. And it was completely life-changing. I'm forever indebted to the Blade Brothers. And if you haven't watched seasons two and three are now on Netflix. So y'all watch that show. We can do it. Latrice, is, is life divide, divided into before Drag Race and after Drag Race for you? Oh, honey, yes. <laughs> there is like, no, I mean, I've always been a hustle baby. Like, I've always been on the hustle and on the grind, but never to this magnitude. This is like, it, it surpassed my wildest uh, dreams and imagination. Um, and, you know, I auditioned. Basically because I, I mean, I was a fan like everybody else. I started from season one and then it was season three that really got, got to me, you know, I, I, there was big girls there. There was, there was Delta and Stacey Lane. I was like, ooh, we got, we got two chances for a big bitch to take it. Okay. And then mm, you saw what had happened. <laughs> <laughs> Stacey started crying because she was fat and she didn't know it, I guess. I was like, girl, like embrace it all, honey. Stop crying about it. So I wrote them, I went, she got eliminated for the cupcake challenge. And I went in my room right then and I emailed them and sent them my pictures. And I just basically said, I can show you better than I can tell you. I'm larger than charge and I'm, I, and here's my phone number. And I got a call two days later. It was on the, 
yeah, it was on a Tuesday and I got a call two days later on Thursday asking for an audition tape by Monday. And I was like, bitch, I'm busy. I got to work. Okay, I ain't got, got time for this. They're like, don't worry about making it pretty. Just do it, you know, very raw. So I literally, my audition tape was me at my computer taping myself, getting ready, answering the questions. And then I did a runway and that was that. A very raw. And that's all it took. Word. Like the rawness, honey. You, did you just say though she was fat and didn't know it? Because if that's what I, I heard, yeah, exactly what you heard. I'm going to be saying that in my that is now in my uh, vernacular. Now I will definitely be saying that ah. me and my me and my my brewery horse of an ass behind me here, and I will be saying that definitely. So I'm sure. I mean, can can you can obviously you can, perhaps can go out as your out of drag. I bet people are still going to recognize. Oh God! Them. There is no camouflage yeah. because they, you know, they show us, you know, both ways, and uh, people are connected to us as, you know, the man behind the woman as well. So there is no camouflage in this, you know. And I, I can be in a group full of drag race girls, and I'm the only one that gets noticed and and picked out. It happens all the time, and they just kind of scurry away and let me take <laughs> take the hit. Everybody <laughs> while they escape, you know. But it's cool. Like it's cool. Girl, I experienced that on Heels of Hell. I watched it. You watched it. You just going to be sitting there, bitch. I don't know shit. She ain't lying. Peaches, what, what has the attention and the, the mainstream love that's being thrown toward drag these days meant to your life and career? Well, it's been really interesting because for me, you know, I got started in drag because it was niche and weird and punk rock and scary. And, you know, all the things that I loved about drag were kind of the fact that it wasn't popular. You know, like, I mean, there was a whole chunk of the gay community who were like embarrassed by drag queens. And I loved that. I think I really enjoyed it. Um, but now I have to say, as someone who's been doing drag a long time, I'm really grateful that um, we can enjoy sort of the success of, of our hard work and sort of sticking with it. And, and the fact that, you know, things like uh, Drag Race and Dragula um, have come along and made drag really popular. Um, it's been wonderful for me and wonderful for my friends. And it's been, you know, I do shows now at the Castro Theater. You know, when I started, it was, you know, I did shows in a, in a little tiny movie theater at midnight, you know, or, or at the stud, you know, for a few hundred people. Now I do two shows a day at the Castro Theater, which is 1400 seats, you know, and sometimes they both sell out. And, you know, this is a direct result of the marquee value of the, the entertainers I get to work with, like Latrice, you know, where you do a Mr. Act and you have Latrice and Willem and, you know, and you put, put on this big show and this huge audience shows up. So I would be lying if I said I'm not enjoying the popularity or the success of it. That being said, I don't always love sort of the, the, the fan culture these days. Um, it used to be that drag fans were cool. They were great. They were artists. They were, they were fellow freaks. They were fellow weirdos. Um, now I'm getting read by 13-year-old cunts on Instagram. You know? <laughs> I don't need that in my life right now, you know. <laughs> Is that so, a conflict if you're 13? Is that what that's referred to as? I don't know. I'm sorry to hear that that's happening, but yeah, that's kind of, they almost like, you know, we all need t-shirts that say, don't read the comments. That's what, what we all need true. to remember. With, well, what's with funny with the Dragula fans, oddly enough, like you think like the weirder, more punk rock bitches would have like more hateful fans, but they're actually the fucking sweetest things. Like I've noticed there's a Stark difference between the Dragula fans to the Drag Race fans. It's a complete difference. It's day and night. But that makes but sense because the Dragula fans are, are the kids who grew up being bullied. Yeah. You know, yeah, they're, they're the, the weirdos. Queers. Yeah. They're the alternative. And the other thing is, because um, I, I wanted, you know, La Latrice and I have worked together and I just adore her. She's a super close friend. I'm so glad we get to be on the show together. But I also wanted to say in regards to judging Dragula and seeing bitch put in, one thing she didn't really say was that she was like far beyond everyone else. And me and Coco were able to give her the, you know, the, the prize easily. Like she nailed the challenge. She, I mean, bitch, you are so talented. 
Aww, truly talented, you. and I hope we get to work together. I really want to work with you. It would be an honor and dream to do one of your shows, seriously. Well, even, just, if I, even if I'm the girl that hands out tickets at the front, I'll do it. Ah. <laughs> We'll I'll, I'll sell up. popcorn. I'm happy to come. Oh, bitch! It. I work concessions. I used to do that for my brother's baseball games. Bitch, I love a concession stand. I like to eat. <laughs> I do pop. I can make popcorn from scratch, girl. I'll just sweep serving with sweet tea. It'll be a good time. Uh, well, popcorn from scratch. What is that? <laughs> girl, I make it from scratch. I don't do that bag shit. You get the popcorn lug. You just put it in the pot with some coconut oil. Okay. Put it on. Get it get popping. Get that movie yeah. theater butter. Yeah. <laughs> so not only do you get to learn all this, you also get a recipe now with our show. So this is a, a, a bonus with purchase, just like at the Clinique counter that we can't go <laughs> to. But um, I was going to say, with you mentioned Miss Coco, and I remember talking to her, and she went on an, to an event, I don't know if it was a cruise or some, something that was mostly Drag Race fans. And she was worried that the Drag Race queens and the fans weren't really going to know that she'd been doing it for a long time. And she said that quite the contrary, it ended up being the friendliest experience and that they really did want to meet her and they were, that they respected the other queens who'd come before. And I, I assume that it has been the experience of, of folks on here, whether they're the younger one, like, you know, like Bitch Puddin, looking up to someone or, or you know, someone uh, meeting someone who's new to it and saying, yeah, um, you know, I love what you've done and you're one of the reasons I'm doing this or, or something like that. Has that been your experience as well? Uh, well, I guess I, I, I feel like Coco and I, I, a good story about that is when Coco and I first went to DragCon the very first year together, we actually arrived together. And I, to World of Wonders credits and the producers of DragCon, they really went out of their way to make sure it wasn't uh, the drag race convention. I mean, they, they you know, brought us in and made sure that we, we had booths and were welcome there and on panels. And Coco and I were just blown away because we never could have imagined drag being this popular. And while most of the fans do know the girls on the TV show, for sure. I mean, I remember Latrice had a line. Do you remember this, Latrice, that first drag con? You had the longest line. It was like wrapped around the auditorium. And that told me right there, like, oh, it's because nice queens can become very popular. People love Latrice. I mean, she was literally the biggest thing at the convention. Well, I, I, you, you know what I mean. <laughs> was a fat joke. That was not a fat joke. That was a, a, a <laughs> fat yeah. Yeah, she's, she's but, but, fat but, <laughs> exactly. but, but, the fans were super, I was just going to say the fans were super nice to me and Coco and, you know, they call us legends. And um, I'm fine with that. You know, it's, it, it's really, you know, it, it means we're old and we've been doing it a long time. I'm <laughs> totally fine with that. I was gonna say, the, the thing that brought me to, to writing about drag and doing the drag book was because I, I kept meeting people who kind of thought drag began with the first season of Drag Race. And I was like, no, no, you have to understand that people have been doing it you know, for, since the dawn of, of entertainment, people have yeah. done some form of drag. And so when I was like, well, I have to focus on the people uh, who are legends in their own towns. So that's why Peaches is there. And look oh, at this gorgeous God. photo. So I uh, have to have her and it's signed. All, my, all the queens are signing my book. So, uh, but it just was important to me to, to sort of give some propers to folks who've been at it uh, long before the, the TV show came about. People, and you know, RuPaul knows who they are. The drag queen, a lot, the, the sharpest ones know who the performers are and, and who, you know, who their, their legends are. I also want to say, here it is again, folks. Uh, you can Venmo a virtual cover to Big Wigs Live, and it would be swell if you would, because then everyone can get a little something, something for doing our show, and we can keep bringing the show to you with big names uh, every week. I have to say that's been the greatest joy about doing this is that the folks who've said yes are of the caliber that we're talking today. Latrice Royale, Bitch Puddin, Peaches Christ. I mean, these people are just amazing. And, and the fact that they're deigning to do our, our digital show makes me very happy. I want to look and see what other questions folks have sent into us. Oh, you know, someone asked, 
if you have to do a lip sync, what is your absolute favorite song to lip sync to? Peaches, talk to us. This is gonna sound totally crazy, but I love the song Stigmata by Ministry. Stigmata by Ministry, okay. Yes. Uh, and Latrice, favorite song to lip sync Give to? me Aretha any day, any time. <laughs> we gonna do it, we gonna take it to church, honey. How was doing Aretha on, on uh, uh, Snatch Game? Uh -huh. You know my Snatch Games did not go very good looking. Honey, I had <laughs> <laughs> both times it was just like, mm -mm. some bullshit was going on. But I had fun doing it, you know what I mean? It was, it was, it was fun. Latrice, if you uh, go on All Stars for the third time, you have to do your Whoopi Goldberg from Sister Act because you are flawless. Let me tell you how sure I am that I'm never <laughs> doing that again. Okay, let's just be clear. Never you know, was about that. <laughs> <laughs> Bitch, talk to us. What song, if you have to lip sync, what's the number one song to do? Oh, I, I gotta give you a couple, okay? Number one, Lita Ford, Kiss Me Deadly. Number two, White Snake, Here I Go Again. Uh, pour Some Sugar On Me. There's an epic video of my mom performing it and I performing it at Machine and Bosses, the first time she ever saw me in drag. We, she like bitch putting is essentially my mom drunk at a naval function. She's a navy wife, so when she was ah. drunk and entertaining the audience, that's exactly like I just soaked her up and rinsed her out, and this is who she is. She also was like '80s rocker babe, very that. But we kill um, Def Leppard all the fucking time, bitch. And uh, yeah, pour some sugar on me. There's an iconic video where she tells a cartwheel and she almost eats shit, but she does it. She nails it, and then she I pour a beer on myself, and then she tries to pour a beer, and there's like four drops of pour on her. It's so fucking funny. It's a good clip. <laughs> <laughs> so one of our uh, viewers, Dan, wrote in and said, uh, much love to Latrice and virtual kiss and hug to Peaches from Miller Brooks in Provincetown. And wanted to know, will you be going out to the Cape? Do you think it'll happen? Do you, do you, uh, do you think the summer will be as always? Or, or, or what do you think? I'm skeptical. I'm really skeptical. Um, I'm scheduled to go there, and they haven't canceled me yet. So I'm supposed to go in July, but I'm really skeptical because uh, they're canceling things little by little, literally every day. So I don't know. What do you think, Peaches? Well, I, I'm not scheduled to go this summer, um, and I love Provincetown. I've done a few seasons there, and I hope, you know, if, if – this season clearly is not going to be a regular season, no matter what, right? So, but, but beyond that, it's hard to predict. They have canceled some of the big themed weeks as far as the official themed weeks like Bear Week and um, the Family Week and uh, the 4th of July weekend. And that leads me to believe that it's going to be a tough season, you know? And I, I really hope for the performers and, and everyone that if this summer is, a, a, you know, a real challenge, that in 2021, everyone's able to kind of come back and, and put things back together. But yeah, it's hard to know. Yeah. Well, we'll, I, we'll see, but it's, it's making all of us be more inventive. I tell people it took a global pandemic for me to go back on the air every week. I mean, I was doing a radio show every day, three hours a day, five days a week for 12 years. And it just talked and talked and talked. And then I hadn't done it for four years. And then it was like this. And I was like, oh, I could do that. It's yeah. like, I, you know. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Definitely, definitely let's do it. So I love this. So Maddie wrote in and asked, if you could be any kind of animal, what kind of animal would you be and why? This is like a uh, sort of a Barbara Walters question. So if I could be any kind of animal, what would I be and why? I would yes. be a golden retriever because they love by everybody and also they sometimes poop in the front yard or on your kitchen table. They don't give a fuck. Wow. And they're just lovable and they, they eat everything. And they're like America's sweetheart, you know? But they're also kind of trashy. I like, because they're so cheesy and shit. I'd be a golden retriever. <laughs> Latrice. Um, I would probably be a dolphin. I love the ocean. Bart. I can kick a shark's ass. And I can guide men back to shore. <laughs> <laughs> no, dolphins have been known to drown people. You know that? Because they try to fuck them? Well, that part too, you know. <laughs> Snagging the peace. Yeah. I don't care who I hump. <laughs> just stay away from the blow. That's all that I have. That's it. Stay away from the blow. 
Peaches, what would you be if you were an animal? Maddie um, asks. Uh, you know, you, I, I've had time to think about this and I still don't have a good answer, but I think if, if, you know, who knows, but I would love to be able to fly. So I would love to be a bird, you know, for, for at least a couple of days just to fly around. I think that'd be so cool. I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to be like, I'd like to be a bird for like three days and then just that be something. I don't, I don't want to be a bird forever. Yeah, that would be, be like a temp issue. job. It would just be sort of a temp job as a bird. Would be right. yeah, just a couple of days. Yeah, it's just filling filling in for another bird. Yeah, and, and you get to do it, and, and uh, that that would work out very nicely, I think. I I wonder this, and people have asked this: uh, would it, would your original... hey Frank, your hey Frank, your audio is a little. Can you get closer to the camera? We can't really hear you so well. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you kind of sound like robot stepmom, but we'll go with that. <laughs> well, let's all mute it and unmute it. Let's try oh, there you go. Oh, come on. Well, that, didn't say, that didn't do anything. It did. It did. It's not a bit. It's not a bit. Okay. Okay. Right. Hey. I'll get like that too. Hold on. Hi. Hey, get, get into the, into the mouth. Yeah, but you look flawless. Look at you. It's real. It's because I have a lot of makeup on and Vaseline on the camera. That's season one drag, <laughs> drag race filters right there. Hello. <laughs> want to do that next time. So I want to ask each of you. Would your original incarnation recognize who you are and what you look like now? My who? Peaches. You want to start Peaches or who's first? Okay, so do you, mean, do you mean like when I first did Peaches drag compared to Peaches today? Yes, would she recognize me? Would originally, oh. yeah. Um, no, she wouldn't. I mean, I mean, if you think I look like a clown now, you know, it's like when I started doing drag, I mean, I literally used grease paint. I'm not even joking. I didn't even use actual cosmetics. You know, I put on clown makeup as a drag queen. <laughs> I didn't know any better. I was hideous. I was, I want to do a pageant of boogers because I actually think, <laughs> you know, boogers are really where the best drag queens all get started. The you know what I mean? Oh, it's true. And I, okay, we'll all judge it, and I want to call it Queen X. <laughs> you get it? Yeah, for booger, sure. Queen X, a pageant for boogers. Bitch, Definitely. you got to help me with this. Oh, yeah, I'm God. totally down. I was a booger the first time I ever did it. I was seriously, had, I was the skinniest I'd ever been because I was taking a dance class in college, so my body was right, but like my ass is always great. So I would recognize myself in the future just by looking at my ass, it's the fat ass, it's like, I've just got blood. <laughs> okay. A lot of pizzas had the key to it. I don't know, I just don't pad, people are mad about it. But um, I, I would recognize myself, the first time I ever did drag, I was going seriously for like kabuki, like theater shit, like twisted sister drag. So I would notice the trashiness, but I would just made Atlanta, when I moved to Atlanta, they were like, all right, girl, you can be alternative, but you need to soften it the fuck up. And I got bullied enough that I was like, all right, bitch, I'll take a note. And I was very stubborn, but eventually, all the beautiful trans, like ex-continentals or former continentals and all that shit. They got me together, bitch. The Shonda Brooks is and all them. So that's how I got a little bit softer. But I think I would recognize it just on aesthetic. I'd be like, oh yeah, that's that, that's me. But I'd be like, damn, but, how'd you get to be pretty? I don't I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Latrice, what did you tell us about your uh, what, what original Latrice? No, current Latrice. Hell <laughs> to the no. She would be like. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just allowed to leave the room like, I don't know who the fuck. <laughs> there should be no, no. I was a hot mess. Like, you know, we all come from somewhere. But like you say, boogers, that's good stock right there. You know, you got a good, some good slime there, you know, to work with. And you can shape and mold the boogers, you know what I mean? I, you can roll them up, you know? Yeah. Because that's when you can see a girl or a performer, like, regardless of their gender, like, you can see a drag performer's personality in that moment. You know, like, that's all right, right this is something that needs to be watered, or, like, ooh, girl, let's let her go out to the pasture and die slow down. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, something like that. Yeah, for sure. This is a lot of trial and error, honey. You yep. know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. for real. Because a YouTube tutorial <laughs> might work for somebody, but it don't work for everybody. That's what I mean. No, no. I going to say, but it, it looks pretty swell now. You've all... You've all turned out beautifully. I have. I feel like I'm Charlie of Charlie's Angels now. I. I <laughs> Hi, Charlie. But, uh, <laughs> you can pick out who, which of the angels you need would would like to be. So, 
Um, Peaches, how are things changing in uh, San Francisco? I, I, there's, are there, is there any shakeups there? With is is Hecklina really hitching up the wagon and going to Palm Springs, or is that a lot of hoops? <laughs> oh no, she's gone. She's in. She's in Palm Springs. Boy, so, she doesn't um, mess around. That's quick. I just read about it a few weeks yeah. back, and it was like, okay. It's literally why I think San Francisco has flattened the curve. You know, <laughs> because that whore isn't here basically giving COVID to every gay man under the sun. You know what I mean? I so think COVID originated in her throat, to be honest. Exactly. I think that, yeah, yeah. She's patient zero, let's face it. Yeah. For everything, probably. Yeah, for, for everything. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, so give her credit where, where credit is due. It's like she but drove to Palm Springs and the fog lifted, the pollution is gone, and we have flattened the curve. <laughs> is does each town really have a different drag vibe each city yeah, I think so what do you guys think each i would city? say so yeah. I, I definitely you know people use the term regional i don't like that term but uh it has a negative connotation to it but um <laughs> but no there, there are different definitely different tones uh of drag you know when you go to texas for instance you're going to get your pageant drag for sure. Big hair, big lashes, big old earrings and jewelry and all that big old hair and up dudes. You come down to South Beach, you're going to get girls thinking they real. <laughs> see? See on that? <laughs> That's for sure. And wet and wavy hair, flinging it all over the place, thinking they had a music video. You know what I mean? It's very, <laughs> it's very that, you know? So it's just different everywhere you go. You get a little bit taste of... Uh, the region. I was gonna and say, they, and how they manage things are different too, because like in in the South or like I, for me when I was coming up in Atlanta, hosting was a very important thing. Like you could perform, but you also have to pop on the mic and be able yeah. to talk. And in LA, that's not valued. It's not valued. It's not that it's not valued. There's great hosts here. There's really awesome entertainers here that do it. But I'm just saying that's not something that's like worked into the spectrum because like the nightlife here is different than the nightlife in Atlanta. Nightlife in Atlanta starts a little bit earlier and then you can hang out later. But here it's like the drag shows at midnight, one o'clock, you know, they keep people there to, for the entertainers. It's just it's a different kind of thing, depending on how different bars set, and cities set up their businesses. It definitely is going to differentiate between which city you're in. Is San Francisco, I remember someone saying you never see a San Francisco queen on drag race because it's too punk rock or it's too this or it's too that. Is, is that true at all, do you think? Or is it its own thing so much that it, it remains underground or the underground aesthetic? I actually don't think that's true because uh, San Francisco really has been um, a, a, a sort of a birthplace for a lot of different drag styles. So definitely people associate San Francisco with clowny, campy drag like myself and Hecklina and Sister Roma. But, um, you know, the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence were born out of San Francisco, right. which is an, primarily an activist drag troupe of non-performers who are fundraisers, you know, and educators. Uh, and San Francisco also gave birth to the whole imperial court system, which is very much a pageant style of drag, you know, with, with the sort of like regal royal, you know, also fundraisers. But I think, so I don't think so. I think it's just that in general, San Franciscans... Um, like people, people basically accuse RuPaul of hating San Francisco, and I don't think that's true at all. And in fact, our you know very own Rockham Sakura was on this past she season. Should have gone longer. She's fucking amazing. Yeah, and she's. I mean, I think we're so proud of her. Um, she is the only other um, queen that we've you know had on Drag Race is Honey Mahogany. And Honey has gone on to, she is an elected official right that's now. That's so and fucking she, amazing. Yeah, she's in public office. Yeah. Yeah, she's that's in public weird. office. So she may not have won Drag Race, but she won a public election and is set to become a real, you know, trans activist political leader. So we're really proud of the queens that have been on. But what I do think about San Francisco is there's this sense here that, like, still, you don't have to go on TV to become a big drag star. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's something important to remember. And I wish that other towns could sort of nurture that philosophy and support their local queens and make their own queens, you know, drag stars, you know, especially if they haven't been on television. I think there's- Yeah, I love those t-shirts that say, support your local drag queen, because it's true, you really have to. And, and uh, there's a lot of talent there. And just because you get the imprimatur of having been on television doesn't necessarily mean 
uh, you're better than something you're going to oh. see with someone that nobody knows the name of. I think um, the newer scenes are really doing that well, like Chicago, like T Rex, and all like anyone from Chicago right now has like, if not more followers than some drag race people, uh, they might have even like you know what I mean. They're doing great. Also, Atlanta like is really good about that too, and Miami has a cool scene. I think the newer the newer scenes that are popping up right now are very aware of like, you know what, if you're on TV, great, but like you can be a star at your home hometown. So I think that's cool. Now, while I've got you here, I want to ask one thing as we wind up our show because we're running out of time a little bit. Um, I, I, it pains me to say that. What would you? What is the connection between horror? and drag and and both of you are really you know if you were if one were going to write a book or write a, a a newspaper story about this the first two people you probably would call would be peaches and bitch and so <laughs> tell me a little bit about that like what what is that connection the connection between horror and drag it's it's that off kilterness you know like when you get scared or you feel offended just like oh and it's like when you see a really gorgeous drag queen it kind of or like just a drag creature, it doesn't have to be necessarily gorgeous. If you see someone in drag, it kind of gives you that same, like, it's like that gasp. It's like, it's taking you off center because it's something completely out of your norm, dev like daily routine, seeing an entertainer like that. And I think that's just really fucking cool. It's that natural nostalgic feeling. Like for instance, like my drag is really inspired by like the girls that die. Like the first girl that dies in fucking horror from the movie. Like those bitches look like fucking hookers. She's getting a pizza. She's like, oh yeah, baby. And she's like, oh no. Like the whole campiness of it too. There's just a lot of correlation between horror and drag for me. I just think they're cut from the same cloth. You can't divide them. You really can't. And Peaches, are you the high priestess of horror drag at this point? Would you say? <laughs> no, she is. No, she definitely is. Oh well, thank you. I, you know, I have to say, I, my, the the ultimate drag mother, I think, for all of us horror loving drag queens is Elvira, right? Yeah. So. You know, it's like Elvira, yes, sure, Cassandra technically is a cis woman, but she really is a drag queen, and she should, you know, always be revered as a drag queen, you know, and I grew up just loving Elvira, and I think there's this, this thing between fantasy and spookiness and drag that kind of goes hand in hand, and as young queer kids, especially as sissies, you know, we often identify with horror movies because there's sort of this escapist fantasy of, you know, how to deal with bullies and yeah. monsters. Um, right. So it, it really, you know, it, I, I think, I used to think I was the only young queer kid who loved drag and horror. Now I realize so many of us love it, you know? And so there is that connection there, you know, psychologically. Yeah, and for me, the first queer character I ever saw was Powerpuff Girls, the villain him. And he, I didn't really know he was queer, but he like was in a bathtub going, yes, girls. And like all of a sudden you saw like a stiletto, like thigh high boot come out of the fucking tub. And I was like, I'm scared, but also I want his outfit. So like, <laughs> you know, a lot of queer, a lot of villains are queer. I was gonna say it as a, as a gay person in the audience, you're watching, do you want to be Ursula the Sea Witch or do you want to be stupid Ariel with her thingamabobs? And you know, you want to be Ursula. She's the yeah. greatest. Of course. I mean, I had a crush on Norman Bates. <laughs> <laughs> I think every person watching this show had a, 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 a crush on Norman Bates. And I put out and for if you don't know who Norman Bates is, you <laughs> will have a crush on Norman Bates someday. And uh, just yeah. don't take a shower with him. Even if he says it'll be fun, That's don't good. do it. Just definitely. Don't. Latrice, what's up next for you before we wind up? Um, well, I have some um, digital shows coming up. Uh, this weekend, uh, Saturday, as a matter of fact, I'll be on Stage It doing Life Goes On. And then on Friday, I'm going to be joining Putin. On eight, uh, May 8th. Uh, May 8th. The 8th. May 8th. Yeah, yes, 8th. May 8th. 8th. I'll be joining her uh, digital uh, drag show. And then again on the 9th, I'll be returning to Stage It with Life Goes On. So um, I'm just trying to stay busy and talking to people and trying to make them feel good and bring them joy and let them know we're going to get through this crisis and we're going to be okay and to chill out and keep on eating. <laughs> How many loaves of banana bread have you Baby. made? I Can made three. It? Oh my God. Have you made it into French toast yet? Ooh. No, but now I have to do that. I did make a butter oh. pecan cheesecake. Oh, it was going fast. It was, yeah, I caramelized nuts and ever I caramelized my nuts. Get those so, nuts uh, away from my face. <laughs> 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 Bitch, Putin, you've got so much going on. Where can people see the digital drag show? 
You can tune into the Digital Drag Show each and every Friday at twitch.tv slash bitchpudding. That's B-I-Q-T-C-H-P-U-D-D-I-N. We stream each and every Friday at 7 p.m. PST, uh, PDT, Pacific Daily Time, and 10 p.m. EDT. And uh, yeah, it, it streams internationally. It's completely free to watch. All we ask is like you can tip the performers during the show. Also, there's like a general pool that we divvy up between all talent. And if you are interested in also being in the show or trying out for the show, we are open to all drag talent. We are, do not discriminate. We will have trans drag kings. If you're a fire twirler that has them to have a lip on, great. We want you. And you can apply at digitaldrag.net. I'm glad you mentioned drag kings because some of our viewers have asked about how you feel about drag kings. And I, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but I'm guessing we are all of the all drag is valid. Um, I think it's song yes. every time that we have a transgendered, outly proud woman on Drag Race. That's all I gotta say. Put Sasha Colby on, goddammit. it! Damn. All right. Damn. Oh, and, and also, you mentioned that one could do a virtual cover, and I'm gonna uh, say this again: you Man. could uh, tip and/or send a virtual uh, cover charge to Venmo it to Big Wigs Live, and it'll be divvied up between the cast and the crew, and the queens will get some love, and will all keep us fed and in cosmetics and and uh, uh, vanishing cream so I don't shine too much, things yeah. like that. So if you would do that, we really would appreciate it. And uh, also tell us, please, before we go, tell us about the Quarantine Radio. So uh, a Jinx Monsoon, Binda La Creme, Major Scales, and I just released Queer Quarantine Radio, which is now available as a podcast on Spotify and Anchor, soon to be Apple. And then something that actually just has kind of been finalized that hasn't been announced yet. I'll, I'll announce it right now. But um, we're going to put an event of mine online. It's going to be streamed and you'll buy tickets. And it was basically one of the most significant nights of my life. It's mm. the Roast of Peaches Christ yes, uh, with roasters, uh, Clea Duvall, Heather Matarazzo, Mink Stoll, Elvira, Sister Roma, Coco Peru, Heclina, and John Waters. So that's coming up uh, online. And I, I believe we'll have information about it next week. I'm excited because we had to get everyone's permission to be able to do that, you know. That's Poor awesome. Peaches couldn't get any big names for her show. <laughs> 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 There's nothing better than two hours of watching people call me fat and ugly. <laughs> That's the dream, isn't it? Who would That's say they all put this wig on and shit to get called fat and ugly. That's right. Crazy. As all of our mothers would say, they're just jealous. <laughs> they are. So, Frank, do you want to announce next week's guests? You oh. do it. You do Next it. week, do we it. have Sugar Kane from RuPaul's Drag Race. We have Pissy Miles, who attended uh, the Trump impeachment hearings. Yeah, and we have yeah. Miss Jinx Monsoon coming at you. That's all next week. Uh, and that's every week here. You can follow Flip Phone Events on Instagram to make sure to check everything out. And Frank will be back here. Awesome. In, a, in a different shirt that almost fits. So I, I will be happy to do that. Um, I do want to say one more time, if you guys would feel uh, comfortable doing it, if you've got a little scratch that you can spare, send over a virtual cover charge. We would love it a lot to uh, Venmo it to Big Weeks Live. Also, if you want to read a fun book and curl up with it, you have the time. Uh, Drag Coming to the Big Weeks of Show Business is available on Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com. And uh, buy it wherever it's cheapest, because honestly, it's the same for me. So just... But get it cheap, get it cheap, okay? It's Definitely such good. a good book, Frank. You did such a great job. Bravo. Oh, thank you. That means that really means a lot to me. I, I, I hope I get to update it someday and, and have more people in it uh, who uh, just keep going with it because it is such a vital art form. And it's honestly, it's there's so much that's already happened, but it's only just beginning. And there's so much exciting stuff. And, um, and young, old, out of the wild, brand new, just keep going uh, and, and make us all happy because uh, I, I feel like during this quarantine, I, I'm seeing the drag queens not only put on shows because they want to eat, but also because they feel the, the need for some levity and for some glamour and something to take people away from their troubles. And nobody does that better than drag queens. They really yeah. are the last of the true entertainers who are going to give you a good time whether you want it or not. They're, they're not leaving until you had that orgasm. So definitely, definitely. Um, 
if you, I'm sorry, I'm getting messages and I don't want them during my big uh, impassioned speech here, but the drag queens really do, uh, they're the last of the entertainers and they're truly going to give you that thrill of the life and they're going to tickle you with that feather to you smile and God love them for doing it. And, and uh, I always say on the show, in all the world, I do not jest, you know I love the drag queens best. 